Hello friends, you are watching the Central Asian Roads channel. Today, we will show you a very long film that covers our entire journey through the Juka Gorge and back. The Juka Gorge has been familiar to our viewers. We are immersed in it further and further with each season. In winter, we managed to travel 20 kilometers, in spring, almost 40, and in summer, we finally reached the farthest planned point, the second of three mountain lakes that are located on the Juku Pass, that is, after the gorge. Why didn't we plan to go to the third lake? You'd ask. Let's say honestly. The path to it seemed too difficult to us, judging by the reports of other road travelers. If we had discovered on the spot that we could drive further than the second lake without too much effort, we would drive further. Although last summer it turned out on the contrary. We wanted to get to the second lake, but we only managed to get to the first. Higher up we found a blockage and an earth mover removing stones from the road. These are the consequences of an avalanche in July 2022. A group of hikers was then lucky to see the avalanche very close and not suffer from it. However, the rockfall was serious and as a result, the already difficult path to the pass turned out to be pretty covered with stones. So this time we didn't make any grandiose plans. We saw on one of the maps that there was a campsite at the second lake, and we were going to reach it and stay there overnight and go back in the morning. Therefore, we set out not too early and were at the beginning of the gorge at about 10 a.m. The weather constantly changed from clear to cloudy. From behind the distant mountains, rain clouds were moving towards us and sunlight broke through from time to time. It had rained for several days the day before, but the road was nowhere washed out to a critical condition. The road at the beginning of the gorge along the wide valley of the Juca River has hardly changed compared to April. There are still many gullies, although they are all partially filled with sand. Apparently this happens naturally. Let us remind you that in April, when the snow was still melting, we were only able to drive half of the road. Where the forested part of the gorge ends, the soil changes from sandy to clay. The riverbank becomes muddy and swampy, and the road becomes slippery in wet weather. It's relatively dry now, but we didn't want to be there during heavy rain. While we made our way deeper into the gorge this time, it never rained. In the second half of the journey, we came across several herds being driven and also several shepherds' camps. A year ago, there were much fewer of them, and they were located closer to the beginning of the gorge. There is even a milk tanker running through the gorge. This time we met him in an unexpected place. The truck was standing on one of the streams and several men were clearing its bottom. Perhaps large stones had been deposited after the recent rain. Apparently they had almost finished the job by that moment. And soon after that we saw that a new bridge had been built next to the old, almost collapsed bridge. It wasn't here yet in April, but we started meeting tourists only at the very end before the pass. A year ago, there were more of them. Perhaps, in the short period between rains, few people want to climb so deep. The rains affected the reservoirs of the gorge in different ways. For example, there is less water in the first lake now than at the end of last July. This time, we drove much faster and easier through the river bed, where the ascent to the pass begins. Here, continuous thickets of thorny bushes begin and among them is lost a well-worn trail that will lead to the only ford. Behind the ford there will be another old rickety bridge. Navigators know this road, but often lose it. It's better to look with your own eyes and follow the fresh tracks of other cars. However, in order to drive in the wrong direction and get stuck in the river, you need to try. If you take a wrong turn, there will simply be no passage there. Boulders block it. The climb to the pass is difficult and risky. It hasn't improved at all over the past year. The road is narrow, very narrow in places. It has both steep slopes and sharp turns. About half the way to the second lake passes over scattered stones, fragments of rocks left after landslides. Sharp stones with a disgusting sound crumple under the wheels and hit the bottom of the car. In several places, Large boulders lie so close that you can barely squeeze between them. It is possible to turn around along the way, but there are very few places suitable for this. So, if you have already decided to climb, it is better not to change your mind without special reasons. To make it easier for you to imagine, we almost never engage in a lower gear, 
even on very steep and uneven trails. This is a last resort for the most difficult cases. So, on the trail through the Juku Pass, we had to resort to it. This will not hurt, especially on the descent, where stones slip out from under the wheels. This is probably the most difficult of the sections that are considered passable, and where we happen to pass. The danger of slipping or damaging the wheel is very high. The Tozer Pass is much easier to pass in both directions. This is our impression, and we give fair warning. If you want to climb Juku Pass, be prepared for difficulties. So, we were lucky to get to the second lane, and that's where our luck seemed to end. It began to rain, and the clouds over the mountains became denser and darker. We didn't really want to make dinner in the rain, and it was completely unreasonable to stay overnight, with the risk of returning along the washed-out trail. True, there was another option in stock. We could continue our journey, get to the third lake, the largest one, then go through the Juku Pass and drive along the Rabirsu River to the Rabel Valley. This way we could get away from the rain. There were no clouds on that side. But the condition of the road after 3 to 4 kilometers should have become even worse. If you believe the maps and the reports of those who crossed the pass on bicycles or on horseback, and at the highest altitude, one would have to fit into a corridor between boulders. Who knows if one of them has fallen onto the trail since the last photo of the pass was posted, or maybe there's nothing left of the trail at all. In general, the option was clearly not winning. We turned around at a small area above the second lake and headed back. As we descended, clouds continued to fill the sky, but we managed to go through all the most dangerous sections both on the descent from the pass and in the valley. The rain started to catch up with us about halfway. More precisely, it continued to rain in the depths of the gorge from where we hastened to leave. Having descended through the forest from the upper part of the gorge to the lower, we already saw a clear sky with light, cumulus clouds on the horizon. And at the end of the rain, we even managed to pick up some mushrooms in the forest. And we also saw magnificent landscapes in the light of the sun breaking through small windows in the clouds. Such things do not happen under clear skies. This is how we drove the Juca Gorge, there and back in one day. And again, we were not able to make many stops on the way back and spend the night in nature. Well, it could have been worse. The Ministry of Emergency Situations warns about thunderstorms and mud flows and recommends not traveling to the mountains in the next few days. We hope this period will not drag on. There are many more amazing places ahead that we would like to tell you about. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to see all our videos in the format that is more likely to you. We wish you a pleasant viewing.